So far we've covered the first two steps of the general duty analysis for affirmative risky acts and here we're going to be picking up with the last step but I thought I'd remind you first what that three-step analysis is and what we've already learned. The first step is that the defendant has to commit some affirmative risky act that imposes some danger on the plaintiff. Generally speaking when people act they carry a burden or duty of care but we also know that some jurisdictions, in fact the majority of jurisdictions, will limit the scope of that duty and they use the concept of foreseeability to do that. Other jurisdictions that follow Judge Andrews from the, the Paul's graph opinion say that the duty is unlimited and so they essentially skip the second step. But in all jurisdictions there's an analysis of public policy to determine whether or not a duty should exist. Not just for the facts of this particular case, but also should create a precedent that all people must follow once the decision is rendered. We'll see here that not only does public policy round out our analysis, but it can actually be factored into the discussion of foreseeability and how foreseeability influences the scope of the duty. We're going to use the McCollum versus CBS records case in order to analyze the role that public policy plays um, in a general duty analysis. But before we do that, I'm actually going to use this case to review all of the steps in the analysis. So in this case, we have a disturbed 19-year-old with problems with alcohol and emotional troubles, um, who apparently is infatuated with Ozzy Osbourne and his music, and after listening to several albums of Osbourne's music, decides to go into his bedroom and commit suicide. He places a gun to his head and pulls the trigger. His family obviously is so disturbed by this, they decide to sue Osbourne and the record company, in this case CBS Records, uh, for putting out provocative music. Now they're making essentially an argument that this is a risky act, that when you are creating music and you are marketing music to a troubled audience, you are exposing them to a risk of harm that didn't exist before. And so this is an argument based on a, an affirmative risky act. Could you make an argument that there was some kind of a mission? Well, you could. You could say that perhaps there was a failure to provide a warning. Um, for example, on the screen here, I've got a parental advisory that now is included in many albums. Perhaps there could have been some kind of warning provided that was not provided. Um, you could also say perhaps that there was a special relationship that would make up for the omission. In fact, the plaintiff did contend that Ozzy Osbourne was such a cult figure and that his audience was so vulnerable that there was a kind of control reliance dependency that existed between them. And so essentially there was a contention that this was the kind of special relationship that should give rise to a duty of care even if Osborne and CBS Records conduct would be viewed as an omission. Ultimately though the court winds up rejecting that argument. I think the court felt like this relationship, whatever it was, would be too nebulous and certainly too variable. The relationship that a listener might have with an artist could certainly vary from um, artist to artist and even from album to album. And I don't think the court wanted to get too wrapped up into evaluating the scope and content or dynamics of those kinds of relationships. And it would ultimately be too hard just to determine what expectations the parties might have um, and if you were looking at this as a failure to warn case, I don't think the court believed that a warning would have done any good. This was a person who was clearly troubled and decided to take matters into his own hands. So even though you might have been able to make an omission argument and try to argue for a special relationship, uh, that did not work here. And so we're left with this being an affirmative risky act case which means that you then must move to the second component or second step of that analysis. If there is, generally speaking, some duty when you're engaged in an affirmative risky act, what's the scope of that duty and how does foreseeability factor into that analysis? The court 
does a good job here of explaining the flexibility of foreseeability. We learned in Paul's graph that foreseeability can be used to limit the scope of the duty of care, but that scope and the parameters of that scope can be fairly broad or fairly narrow. And here, the defendants, Ozzy Osbourne and his record company, were arguing that the scope of foreseeability should be very narrow. And one of the ways that you could narrow that scope would be to require an extremely high degree of foreseeability that uh, in order to hold the artist responsible, that it must be not virtually certain, but highly probable that putting out this music would cause a serious risk of harm. And in fact, they're able to convince the court that a high foreseeability test or high probability test should apply. And they do that because the court thinks that if you were to impose any other standard of foreseeability, it would be too easy for um, folks that are listening to music or perhaps watching um, movies or perhaps playing video games to be able to bring lawsuits against those artists. So they wanted to create a restrictive standard and that's why they said it had to be highly foreseeable to a reasonable person that by putting out this particular uh, artistic expression that someone would be injured. Now the court, after setting this very high foreseeability standard, decides that it wasn't satisfied here, that Ozzy Osbourne had recorded this music long before John McCollum wound up listening to the music, and so there really was no direct call to suicide. He was only speaking in a kind of artistic metaphor. In fact, the song Suicide Solution was really about drinking yourself to death. As I mentioned, there's really no connection in time. This wasn't like Ozzy Osbourne singing directly to John McCollum in a concert. This was the music being published long before and McCollum picking it up and listening to it years later and ascribing to it his own intentions. Um, there's also some evidence here that John McCollum wasn't really even listening to the song Suicide Solution at the time that he committed suicide. There was actually a different record that was on the turntable. And beyond all of that, I think the court is just um, cognizant of the fact that suicides are a very uncommon thing, that most people, based on their survival instinct, don't take their own lives. And so it's a highly unusual thing. In fact, it's in some states an illegal thing to take your own life. And so courts aren't going to be um, ready to impose an obligation to protect against acts of suicide because it's not really that foreseeable. So there was an argument that perhaps you could make a finding of foreseeability in a case involving a freedom of speech by looking at the Weirum versus RKO, RKO case. In that case, also in California, there was a radio DJ that was traveling from location to location and he was telling his listeners, who were also in this case teenagers, that if they arrived at the location where he wound up being um, first in time, that they would be able to get a prize. Well, some of these teenagers were um, so emphatic about getting there quickly that they sped to that location. Two of the teenagers in one car wound up running the plaintiff off the road, and the plaintiff wound up, or at least the plaintiff um, decedent wound up dying as a result of the reckless driving of those teenagers. So the estate in that case winds up bringing in action against the radio station and the DJ, and they actually were successful. It was a negligence case, and the court here did say that foreseeability would support a duty of care. That in this case, there was a real-time interaction, an immediate conversation, if you will, between the DJ and the teenagers who were listening to it at that very moment. Um, here, the DJ actually was encouraging them to do something at that moment. He wasn't speaking figuratively or artistically. artistically. He was really saying, you need to drive as fast as you can to get to my location in order to get the prize. Um, the other thing is that 
teen speeding or reckless driving is really not a an unpredictable thing it happens all of the time and so all of those factors made it foreseeable in fact perhaps highly foreseeable that if you speak in a way that's going to encourage teenagers to get to a location quickly they probably will and they're going to do it in a way that is highly dangerous i'd suggest that there's some other factors going on in the weirum case that might distinguish it from the Ozzy Osbourne case. The Wareham case really involved commercial speech. This was the radio station trying to use a promotion to advertise itself. They really weren't engaged in any kind of artistic speech or expression. There also was an effective, safer means for them to promote their station. These days, if you listen to radio stations, oftentimes they have you call in and be the second, third, or ninth, tenth caller, depending on what the, the radio station prefers. Um, here also, the plaintiff was just an innocent party. He happened to be a driver in the wrong place at the wrong time, and so you don't have the kind of culpability that's attached to someone who makes a what appears to be a voluntary choice to commit suicide. So for all of those reasons, it looks like the Weirum case really is distinguishable from the Ozzy Osbourne case, where you don't have an immediacy, you don't have a direct encouragement of imminent lawless action. That, all of that notwithstanding, the court does go on and consider public policy. Now, we've already said that public policy had a role to play in shaping the high foreseeability test that the court used to determine scope because the burden on First Amendment free speech rights would be so great if these cases went forward the, the court bumped up the foreseeability standard from mere foreseeability to high foreseeability. But independent of that analysis, the court goes on and considers whether or not it would make good sense from a public policy perspective to hold artists and their record companies liable for the conduct of their listeners. Uh, and so the court really here starts examining the function of public policy. It could support the duty of care. It could narrow the scope, which it already did, or it could actually go all the way and preclude liability or a duty of care entirely. California does a great job of listing the kinds of policy considerations that will be used not just in this case, but in all of the cases in which it goes through this three-step analysis. So I want to run through each of these factors, and you should just kind of look at these factors as a good working list of considerations, policy concerns, if you will, that courts will use in order to determine whether to find a duty and what that duty might be. So the first criterion or factor is the certainty of injury. And here the court's really looking to see whether or not we're absolutely certain that the victim truly did sustain a legally cognizable injury. This usually occurs in cases where we're not certain that the person is injured. And that applies in cases of emotional distress, which we'll talk about later, or in cases of pure economic loss, like a lost business opportunity, which might be speculative. Clearly, that's not a factor here. We have a very certain injury. We've got a plaintiff, or at least a plaintiff's decedent who is deceased, and so the court doesn't have to worry about that as a limiting factor. The second policy consideration is the clarity of the causal connection between the Defendant's Act and the plaintiff, plaintiff's injury. And really, this was a huge problem in this case. There are lots of reasons why John McCullum might have pulled that trigger, um, part of which might have had to do with he bought into the gothic themes of Ozzy Osbourne, but a lot of it had to do with the fact that he was abusing alcohol and he was emotionally disturbed and possibly had some issues with his parents and perhaps even some lack of parental supervision. So instead of sending this case forward and allowing the jury to kind of muck up the causation analysis, the court kind of pre-screens causation and determines that the issues here are so great that it would not make good sense to find a duty and allow the case to go forward. The court also doesn't find that there is any moral blame attached to what Ozzy Osbourne did. He's an artist who's marketing um, 
a record and he's expressing himself under the First Amendment. And so that doesn't appear to be terribly morally blameworthy. In other cases, this factor might be used to say, yes, that the defendant's conduct is so bad that if we're in doubt about a duty of care, we should find a duty and let the case go forward. Another factor the court uses is what burden would be placed not only on the defendant, but on the rest of society if we were to find that a duty of care applies to the kind of conduct involved here. So here we're really talking about artistic expression. And so the court was very concerned about placing on not only Ozzy Osbourne, but any other form of artist, the burden of having to worry about how a listener or someone receiving the expression would interpret it, and especially interpret it in a way that could be either self-destructive or destructive to other folks. In fact, if you were to force Ozzy Osbourne and the record company to think about it, they might actually uh, not put out what are provocative lyrics. And so the audience would lose the opportunity to have that kind of, of gothic music um, that some people may enjoy. And so there would be a chilling effect on the First Amendment. And the court just felt like that was far too high a burden to place not only on the artist, but also on the record company, and maybe more importantly, on the audience who seems to enjoy listening to this music without the risk or fear of either committing suicide or harming other people. Uh, the next policy consideration is deterrence. Is this the kind of case where we really need to deter the conduct uh, because there doesn't seem to be any self-censorship going on um, or the conduct isn't being deterred by any other social system. The court didn't really deal with this, and you might make the argument that maybe Ozzy needed some kind of incentive for deterrence, but I, I think the court felt like this deterrence could rapidly turn into over-deterrence, and that puts you on the slippery slope of putting a chilling um, impact on First Amendment free speech. The court also didn't really deal with law spreading. I mean, if you think about it, it probably would be a lot easier for CBS Records to bear this loss, to absorb the liability and spread the, the cost onto its listeners by raising the cost of a CD um, by just a few cents, or maybe back in those days, the cost of an album by a few cents. Uh, and so ultimately, the court doesn't really address it. It's a factor that seems to favor plaintiffs more than it does defendants because defendants oftentimes will be corporate actors and will have the ability to absorb and spread the loss. But what you can see is you don't have to satisfy all of these policy considerations. Just on balance, the considerations would have to weigh one way or the other. In this case, enough of these factors seem to favor limiting Ozzy Osbourne and CBS Records liability um, and certainly not favoring the plaintiff or the plaintiff's um, decedent under the facts of this particular case. Notice that the most important policy consideration didn't even make the list. The First Amendment was the most compelling factor in the court's analysis. So the lesson from that is that this is a working list and not an exhaustive list, and courts can find other public policies that might be important on a case-by-case -case basis. So we've actually run through here all of these factors and how they apply. The causal connection doesn't seem to be terribly clear. Um, publishing music is not a terribly blameworthy thing. The, the burden on free speech rights would be incredibly high because you'd have to censor the music. Um, and maybe the defendants don't need a whole lot of of deterrence, or perhaps the court just wasn't that concerned about the deterrence, or frankly, even the law spreading argument. 